Welcome to Dividend Cafe this Monday, May the 20th. And we started out this morning um, slightly positive. We were actually above the 40,000 level on the Dow for first, say, two, two and a half hours of trading and then lost some momentum throughout the day. Uh, the Dow ended up closing down 196 points. Uh, both the S&P and the NASDAQ actually registered um, you know, some modest gains on the day. And even with the sell-off, I mean, really, with the volatility index of VIX in the low 12s, really wasn't much of a down day, so I'd call it quiet. Uh, yields were up just slightly. Tens uh, were up about two basis points on the day, closed at 444. So there you have it for a little market recap. Um, you know, there's a interesting note in there about China's markets being up 20% year-to-date and uh, more and more percentage of stocks in China trading above their 200 day moving average in basically a market that's been more or less left for dead. I mean, if you look at a 10, <laughs> 10 year or a 20 year chart, you know, they, they're negative, quite negative. So, you know, th these things just have a funny way of kind of quietly and slowly uh, and discreetly creeping higher again before really anyone notices because the flows that we're seeing in, in ETFs and funds and things are not only still abysmal, but they're still negative year to date. So there aren't too many uh, participants catching on. Uh, and I think it will take some time before there's more conviction before that happens. Um, top news story for the day was the helicopter crash killing Iranians, uh, President Raisi and his foreign minister and six others. Um, and it, was, it looks like it's an accident. There was a, a blizzard type conditions and a lot of fog. I think it was a 30 or 40 year old helicopter on top of that. And they tried to set it down in that storm and, and ultimately all perished on board. Um, so the uh, existing supreme leader of the country has been there since I was in grade school in 1989. Uh, Khomeini uh, said, you know, business will continue on as usual for the country. But um, some potential uh, Middle Eastern te uh, tension around that. There's also an OPEC meeting in, in June. And so some of these things uh, definitely matter from an energy perspective and just volatility perspective. Um, some lobbying from some of the big banks is resulting in what could turn into a reduction in capital reserve requirements for large U.S. banks. This is like the FDIC, the Federal Reserve, the comptroller of the currency. Um, they've already slated it an increase, but they may decrease it by around 20% um, based on some of these uh, lobbying efforts, which would be technically stimulative since that's where the velocity of money in the economy comes from. It's banks lending money. And so if they have to withhold less in uh, capital reserves, that would theoretically provide more to be lent out in new loans, um, as long as people will take the loans at higher interest rates. Um, there is now over a million um, applications to the IRS for the ERC. It's the, that employee retention uh, tax credit. Um, I just mentioned it there because it equates to roughly $100 billion up to that, something like that, which would be you know, again, fiscal stimulus essentially going back into the economy right around the time of the election. So food for thought there. Um, there is uh, increased, um, you know, tariff um, on the, from the Biden administration on China and this sort of ongoing, um, you know, geopolitical tension with, with China. And, um, you know, it speaks to a lot of things. The comment was put in there originally by David and I added to it. But it's, it's also hand in hand with this deglobalization and regionalization theme that we're seeing across the world um, as these things play out. Tariffs make things cost more expensive, you know, increase, increase the cost of them. And then, you know, those widgets get made different parts of the world without tariffs. And so that's that's part of that ongoing theme as well. Um, and it is interesting to note that for how much these policies were more or less hated by the Biden administration in the last campaign, not only are they kept in place, tax rates are still the same and the tariffs are still the same, but they're going to be increased here. So uh, go figure there from a partisan, partisan perspective. Um, on rates in housing, you know, at, at 25% of mortgages, um, I'm sorry, 25% of homeowners in the country don't have a mortgage, 35% of Americans rent. And then the 40% of Americans that have a home, uh, own a home with a mortgage, you know, most of those have termed out their debt into lower interest rates. And so that's one of the reasons why we've had a little more resiliency in this rate, rate tightening cycle, at least on the consumer side. Um, 
and uh, so the um, they're in the Fed land. There was quite a bit of Fed speak. Frankly, on the economic front today, there wasn't really a whole lot of new news. Um, we get a beige book or the minute, sorry, released from the last Fed meeting on Wednesday. So we've got that going on today. There was different speakers, Jefferson, Bostic, Mester, you know, they mixed bag, you know, citing inflation moving in the right, you know, moving in the right direction, but still needs to be more to come before they can actually lower rates. And my comment was just keep in mind, they've already curtailed quantitative tightening here. So there's about a 65% chance now that there'll be a um, the first rate decrease in September. And ultimately where it goes over time in a perfect world, which of course it isn't a perfect world, but all things considered equal, you know, something around a Fed funds rate 1% above inflation seems realistic, at least to me and to us. Um, so that would, you know, call it inflation at, at around two, then you're looking at a Fed funds at around three and we're at five and a half. So when would they start on that path? We still think it's Q4 roughly of this year. So more to come there. Um, there was a comment, or at least on the question and answer section that David took about uh, the amount of government debt basically in the dollar um, and will it become more weak or replaced or something like that. It's just a relative game. You have to understand that the Eurozone and Japan te technically from a demographic perspective are in, a, in worse shape than the US. Um, and so those you know, debt to GDP ratios are worse and behind it, the economies are slower. And so it's kind of hard to replace a dollar with some other currencies. In other words, what would be the other currency at this point? Um, not to say that it's okay for these government deficits and debt levels, but that's just sort of the world that we live in at, these, at this point. So with that, I'll let you go. Uh, get to your Monday evenings with hopefully your families and uh, reach out with questions, please. I'll be around all week. I know David's traveling here a little bit, but I look forward to hearing your questions and I'll be back with you. Thanks so much for listening. Mm -hmm.